Hey, happy Monday. Come on in, pull up a chair. The Gaming Gang Dispatch is in the air. Howdy, 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 gang. Welcome once again to the Duct Tape Studios. I'm Jeff McAleer, your host, here at the Gaming Gang Dispatch, brought to you by, amazingly enough, thegaminggang.com, which I happen to be the founder and editor-in-chief. Welcome aboard. Tonight is Monday, February 28th, 2022. This is live stream. 758. If this is your first time joining me, let me point out, super, super casual around here. Just hanging out, talking about the latest in tabletop gaming news, and then taking a look at a tabletop game release. So tonight, we are going to take a peek at Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Uber's Reich Adventures Volume 2 for my friends over at Cubicle 7 Entertainment. I believe there are a half dozen adventures in this hardcover here, and we are going to dive on in. We are going to take a peek. We are going to have some fun. Yes. So, also, if you have not joined me before, let me kind of tell you how this works. About the first half of the show, about 30 minutes or so, is devoted to the latest in tabletop gaming news. Then we move on to the look at a game. So if you are watching live, kick back, relax. Like I said, super, super casual around here. And we will get into the first look at Uber's Reich Adventures Volume 2 in just a little bit. If you're watching at least 30 minutes or more after the stream ends, then there will be timestamps. You can actually jump ahead. You don't have to catch the tabletop gaming news of the day, although there's a lot of cool news. I would hope you would. But you can use the timestamps, and depending on the device that you're watching on, you might even find those timestamps right on the timeline of the video that you're watching. So keep that in mind as well. Of course, if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already, and if you do subscribe, ding that bell. It will not only let you know when the Dispatch streams live Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday evenings at 7 p.m. Central right here on YouTube. Also let you know when I upload other videos, such as my review of the Old School Essentials Advanced Fantasy Referee's Tome. That's right, I uh, shared this yesterday. So I have completed the trifecta of old school essentials, hardcovers, or I guess I should say tomes, because there are three of them. So uh, definitely give this one a peek. Gotta say, I really love old school essentials. I am going to utilize it when, uh, when I run my little uh, fantasy campaign, my little old school campaign with... Uh, my niece, nephew, their friends, maybe Elliot Miller, my best friend, don't know, and possibly even my brother, who I don't think has actually played a role-playing game since 1981. Yes, I ran him. He was the first person I ran Call of Cthulhu for, and of course, it was the Haunted House adventure. So, isn't it, isn't it called The Haunting? Because I know they changed the name of it recently, but I could have swore I, I thought it used to be called The Haunting for decades. Anyway, when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in tabletop gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. And when I say a whole lot more, I do have a team of correspondents who provide reviews 
for role-playing games that you will not catch on the channel. So keep that in mind. A lot of Onyx Path publishing releases get reviewed. A lot of the um, Age of Sigmar, Warhammer Age of Sigmar role-playing releases. So there's a lot of stuff going on over at the website that you just won't catch here on the channel. Of course, lastly, if you are watching live, there is chat available. That's right, it's a live stream, so there is chat. It's not on screen, it's one of the ways I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. But if you wanna say howdy, or maybe you've got a question, a comment, by all means, chime in. I will do my best to respond. Also should point out that you must be a subscriber to the channel for at least 48 hours before you can take part in chat. Yet another way I keep some of the more unusual commenters at bay. So first out the gate tonight was the Motor City Madman. That's right, the Madman is with us. He is one of our chat moderators, by the way, so behave. Oh, Viper Dave's here. Uh, well, geez, Viper Dave usually shows up at the end. So I guess I better wrap this up. All right, everybody, thanks for tuning in. My good friend from high school, Scott Weagle, is joining us. Haven't seen Scott in a while. Good to see you, Scott. Mr. Eddie T is hanging out in chat. So, of course, that must mean uh, Sarah D is also lurking, keeping an eye on the show as well. So, welcome aboard, everybody. We're going to jump into the tabletop gaming news in just a moment. But uh, first, I got to say, it's a whole different world we're living in today than it was last week. Hmm. Well, well, well. Saw that coming a mile away. I'm sure all of you out there saw it coming a mile away and we're not listening to the handful of politicians who don't seem to uh, believe the, uh, the American intelligence agencies. So I, I try to stay away from politics, right? But I also do not live in a bubble, you know? Uh, I'm, I don't live in the, in the duct tape studios. So all I got to say is, uh, if your elected officials where you live are supporting Vladimir Putin or making excuses or saying that, uh, oh, well, Russia's got every right to be invading Ukraine, you better start taking a look to see where these people are getting paid. Whose payroll are they on? Because they sure aren't working for you or fellow Americans. Yeah. Anyway. Coco B is with us. Sarah D has chimed in saying she's always lurking. 245 Trioxin is with us as well. Uh, so yes, so most definitely, uh, I stand in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. I might actually do a live auction a little later on this week and uh, donate all proceeds to a, uh, a charity that is supporting the Ukrainian people. I just have to take a look to see, you know, uh, yeah, because, you know, these are, the, these are the times where you start seeing some, some kind of shifty characters get into, uh, you know, oh, well, this charity benefits uh, me. So I got to do a little homework. So stay tuned. I will talk about that in further depth if and when I decide I'm going to do that. I might just put a bunch of stuff up on eBay and just donate the proceeds from that and not go through, you know, I don't want to say hassle, but just, you know, the, publicity of it not that there's publicity but you know what i mean i don't, I don't necessarily want to be sitting there going oh good jeff oh making a difference jeff yeah no not at all all right so shall we jump on into the news because that's what you're hanging out to see you don't want to listen to me pontificating about politics and uh you know global events Arriving in stores next month is Freight Cars. It's coming from Quick Simple Fun Games. Well, I guess there's truth in advertising there in their name, right? Here's the details. 
Freight cars is set in the not-so-distant future, where corporations have superseded governments for global control. With the dawn of improved maglev technology, competition on the high-speed railways of America is fierce. Players take the helm of a grand shipping company, delivering produce to the north, lumber to the south, and oil and coal coast to coast. Profit is the name of the game as players strive to earn the most credits. Fill your cars with Tetris-style freight pieces and make deliveries faster and more efficiently than your competition in order to win. Two to four players can take part in this quick, simple, and fun puzzle game that only takes about a half hour to play. Do you have what it takes to seize the rails? Freight Cars is, once again, for two to four players, ages eight and up, Plays in around 20 to 30 minutes. It's going to carry an MSRP of $29.99 when it arrives on March 23rd. The artwork to this looks very uh, modious like it's, it's, got, it's got this French style to it, like, like Mobius. Uh, the late... Mobius, I guess I should say. And I thought, I was like, huh, that looks kind of interesting. I am not sure where Quick Simple Fun Games is out of. They might be here in the U.S. Like I said, I don't know. But I wouldn't be shocked if they were a French company because of that art style. This could be kind of fun for the family. Kind of, you know, a little puzzly action, too. Kind of like Coco B says, they lurk, too. Yes, I too lurk. That's what they wrote. Moving right along, coming in the third quarter of this year from Alley Cat Games, which I do think is a French company, is Starfighter's Rapid Fire. Here's the scoop Starfighter's Rapid Fire combines the excitement of real time dice rolling with tactical starship combat. Each player hops into the cockpit of their own Starfighter and duels it out in a dogfight to prove who is the superior pilot. The game plays in multiple modes. 1v1, 3-player free-for-all, 2 versus 2 or a solo mode where a single starfighter attacks an orbital space station. Kind of surprised it's for 4 players. Isn't there 4-player free-for-all? It only says 3 players. In the real-time phase, all players roll and re-roll their command dice simultaneously and assign them to the various functions of their starfighter. When a player has fully charged systems and is ready to act, they may end the real-time phase by hitting the big red button and yelling, FIRE! No joke, that's what it says. The big shiny candy-like button. The shiny red candy-like button. That's a blast from the past. Let's, uh, let's see if anybody in chat actually knows what that's from. This means all players must cease rolling and allocating dice and move to the tactical phase. In the tactical phase, players then alternate activating the systems they have charged. This allows them to fire torpedoes or lasers at the enemy, maneuver around the map, adjust their shields, and other actions unique to their chosen starfighter. Players must balance the pressure of real-time play while making good tactical and strategic decisions. Game only ends when one starfighter is destroyed. The pilot that hits the finishing blow gets all the glory and is the winner. Starfighter's Rapid Fire is for one to four players, ages 10 and up, plays in around 20 to 40 minutes, and it's going to carry an MSRP of approximately $49.99 when it arrives this summer. Got some uh, anthropomorphic animals there on the cover. Got some little miniature models as well. So I guess there are four unique Starfighter models to this. Could be kind of interesting. I know a lot of people really do dig the, the whole chuck and dice real time uh, and uh, just kind of assigning dice as they roll. I'm like, eh, it's all right. 
I just it's just not a mechanic that I'm super thrilled with. Because one of the things is I always find that people like I don't know what it is. Maybe it's just the people I play with get so worked up that all of a sudden it's like whoa. They're like whoa. Dice go flying. There is a new bundle of holding. Well, I guess it's, well, maybe it's not that new, but it's new to the show. And it features the Fiasco one-shot role-playing game from Bully Pulpit Games. And here are the details on the deal. Adventura! This all-new Fiasco 2020 bundle presents digital downloads of the recent card-based edition of Fiasco. Jason Morningstar's cinematic game of powerful ambition and poor impulse control from Bully Pulpit Games. Funded in a big August 2019 Kickstarter campaign, the new fiasco plays more smoothly and intuitively than ever. So your hapless character's stupid plans collide with reality faster and harder. This bargain priced offer is also ornamented with eight live action freeform games on cheery topics like dimensional warfare, deep sea romance, dying cowboys, and domestic cannibalism, all designed by Jason Morningstar for the Bully Pulpit Games Patreon campaign. For just $12.95, you'll get all five titles in the starter collection, the retail value of $44, as DRM-free PDFs, including the complete card-based fiasco game used to be dice based but you kind of like traded in dice to take over a scene it has been so long since i reviewed fiasco i it's got to be like at least 10 years since i reviewed it but i thought it was very cool also includes four freeform live action rpgs deep love space post space post Oh, wait, that's Ghost. Sorry. The Underwater People and Welcome Guests. If you pay more than the threshold price, $25.64, you'll level up and also get the entire bonus collection with eight more titles worth an additional $56, including four expansion card sets for Fiasco, Feel the Rush, Fiasco USA, Teen Angst, and Unknown Monsters as well as four more Bully Pulpit Patreon games. The Black Drink, Cowboys with Big Hearts, The Crushers, and Uncle Gordo's House. These savings run through March 9th, and 10% of your payment, after gateway fees, will be donated to the charity designated by Bully Pulpit Games, the Minds Advisory Group, an international organization that saves lives and builds futures through the destruction of landmines, unexploded ordnance, and other weapons left behind after conflicts. Uh, so, you can score this through March 9th, and I gotta say, this is a pretty sweet deal. This is the newest edition of Fiasco that came out, which I believe physically is, is actually a box set. I could have swore the Kickstarter was for a box set for Fiasco. And the way I explain Fiasco to people is if the Coen brothers decided they were going to create a role-playing game, that is essentially what Fiasco would be. Now, I know there are a lot of people out there who maybe don't necessarily want to play broken people or people who are faced with some, uh, you know, a situation gone wrong. There are other adventures out there, other one-shots, that aren't kind of like, you know, oh, yeah, okay, so we're playing Racing Arizona, huh? But that is kind of what Fiasco's known for. On to another news piece. March is going to bring a trio of Pathfinder releases from Paizo Inc. Here's what's going to be on the horizon. But first, Scott got it. The red candy-like button is from Ren and Stimpy. It is from Space Madness. I know. We don't, we don't 
talk Ren and Stimpy anymore because of the, the scumbag who was the creator of it. Uh, but still, it was a classic back in the day. I know. Isn't, doesn't it suck? You have to sit there and be like, Ugh. gosh, I remember how funny some of those Ren and Stimpies were. And then you're like, Ugh, but they're tied to that dude. Like, uh, isn't it like Robert K or something like that was what he went by? Uh, all right, let's talk about some Pathfinder news because first we have the Pathfinder Adventure Path 174, Shadows of the Ancients. It is the finale of the six-part Strength of Thousands Adventure Path. Yes, you have probably heard me talk about this for months because this has actually been delayed for months. I think it's been delayed like three months. But I guess Paizo's pretty sure it's going to be out uh, in March, late March. Save the Magumbia. The heroes return to the Magumbia Magic Academy to find the villain they'd vanquished on a distant planet had set another scheme in motion long ago. Spoilers! Students and teachers have been twisted by evil magic, and the heroes must engage in legendary tests to gain the means to free them. While a monstrous foe thrashes through the Magambia, it's up to the heroes to save the school from utter destruction. Shadows of the Ancients is a Pathfinder adventure for four 18th level characters by Sayef Ansari. This adventure concludes the Strength of Thousands adventure path a six-part monthly campaign in which the heroes rise from humble students to influential teachers and ultimately decide the fate of the Magambia. This adventure provides guidance to tell stories that are like fables or set in truly unusual adventure locations and concludes with a powerful look at monsters, magic, and abilities that only the mightiest Magambian heroes can claim. This soft cover will carry an MSRP of $24.99. You'll be able to grab the PDF for $17.99. 245 tracks and points out it was John K who did Ren and Stimpy. Thank you, 245 Trioxin. I gotta be honest, I haven't thought of Ren and Stimpy in years and years and years. Scott says, old guys rule. Old guys whose memory banks still work rule. <laughs> Next up, we've got the Pathfinder Adventure Path 177. I know you're like, wait a second, huh? Didn't we go from 174? Now we're at 177? Yes, because the first one's been delayed. But I'm talking about Burning Tundra. This is the finale of the three-part quest for the Frozen Flame adventure path. The Broken Tusks find sanctuary at last in the settlement of Hillcross, but invading frost giants quickly force the clan scouts to lead their mighty following's defense against the siege and take on new titles. To put a stop to the slaughter, the newly named Mammoth Lords take the fight to their foes by riding their bestial mounts through the sucking muck of the Tarmanian Tar Forest. At the heart of these black woods, amid the ruins of a half-sunken crusader's castle, the heroes wield the sacred light of the primordial flame to defeat their ancient enemies once and for all. Maybe. Unless your characters mess up, then all is lost. Burning Tundra is a Pathfinder adventure for four eighth-level characters. This adventure concludes the quest for the Frozen Flame Adventure Path, a three-part monthly campaign in which the heroes lead a band of nomadic hunter-gatherers across a brutal primordial landscape. This adventure also includes the Gazetteer, the mountain meeting grounds called Hillcross, megafauna animal companions, and ancestral gear that complement the new Mammoth Lord character archetype. Yes, there's a new archetype and new prehistoric creatures that befriend or bedevil your players. The soft cover will carry an MSRP of $24.99. You'll be able to grab the PDF for $17.99. And then lastly, we have the Pathfinder Flipmat Shattered Dungeon. 
In the wake of terrible disasters, some dungeons survive as shattered ruins that then become infested by all sorts of monsters. This line of gaming maps provides ready-to-use and captivatingly detailed fantasy set pieces for the busy game master. The next time your party follows up on a rumor about an ancient, partially collapsed dungeon when seeking strange treasures and stranger dangers, these maps have you covered with two different underground ruins. Watch out for stranger danger, by the way. Or if you're going into these dungeons, there are multiple stranger dangers. Special coding on each flip mat allows you to use wet erase, dry erase, and permanent markers with ease. Removing permanent ink is easy. Simply trace over any permanent mark with a dry erase marker, wait 10 seconds, then wipe off both marks with a dry cloth or paper towel. Each flip mat measures 24 inches by 30 inches unfolded and 8 by 10 folded. On tabletops across the world, the flip mat revolution is changing the way players run their fantasy role-playing games. Why take the time to sketch out ugly scenery on a smudgy plastic mat when dynamic encounters and easy cleanup is just a flip away. This will carry an MSRP of $14.99. This trio of Pathfinder releases are slated for a late March release. And when I say late March, we're talking like last few days of March is when they're supposed to arrive. One thing I found kind of interesting this month, we have far more releases for Starfinder than we do for Pathfinder. Now, of course, there are still the Pathfinder Society adventures and things like that that are going to be available. It's just, I, I normally don't include those in the news. Just because they're, they're simply, you know, PDFs. Anyway, keep your eyes peeled. Tomorrow I will talk about all the Starfinder goodies that are on the horizon as well. Lastly, now available for the Mutant Chronicles role-playing game is Siege of the Citadel. And here's the skinny from Modifius Entertainment. Hack your Mutant Chronicles games. Previously only available to Siege of the Citadel Kickstarter backers, this digital release aims to bridge the divide between the Mutant Chronicles role-playing game and the Siege of the Citadel board game. The 82-page supplement presents rules and guidance and converts material from the board game for use in the RPG such as character sheets for 18 legendary characters, including Lori Faust, Max Steiner, and Inquisitor Nicodemus. Most of this PDF's content can be used without any knowledge of or components from the Siege of the Citadel board game, but you will require access to the Mutant Chronicles role-playing game core rulebook. This supplement features an updated 2D20 version of the classic mission Belzec's Black Gate. I swear, it almost reads like ball sacks. Ball sacks, Black Gate. Nah, I think it's Bialzak's Black Gate, hopefully. Mechanics for tactical combat in the role-playing game using grids and tiles. Guidance on creating your own legendary characters. Rules for hacking the Dark Legion's living biotechnology. And RPG game stats for 11 classic monsters and iconic beasts, including the Mercurian Maculator and Praetorian Behemoth. The 83-page supplement is available in PDF over at Drive Through RPG for $13.99. Well, it's good to see Modifius Entertainment still supporting Mutant Chronicles because it was uh, one of their first role-playing licenses they got because I could swear, now I, I am far from an expert on Mutant Chronicles, that is for sure. But this is the third edition, and I think this is the only edition that Modifius has had, is this one. So, don't know. I don't know. I, if I remember, I think, I'm trying to remember if I reviewed one of the books or if, if somebody else reviewed one of the books. It may, it may have been me, but it's been so long. So this is another, you know, role-playing system that I haven't seen much for in years. 
Bob Ross has joined us again in chat. Good to see you, Bob. Thanks for hanging with us once again. That is it for tonight's news. Of course, I was just talking about drive through RPG. Don't forget, Gaming Gang, thus the Dispatch, is affiliated with the One Bookshelf sites. So if you are going to visit drive through RPG, please stop by the GamingGang.com first. Click on one of our banner ads. That way, if you happen to make a purchase, I get a small portion of that sale. All those nickels, dimes, and quarters really do add up and help keep the GamingGang.com around. Also, if you like what I do, if you did this video, if you enjoy the channel, if you like swinging over to the GamingGang.com, by all means, you can always buy me a cup of coffee or some soda by swinging on over to PayPal.me slash the gaming gang and making a small donation and thankfully there are folks out there who utilize our affiliate links i guess we'll say for the one bookshelf sites and who stop by paypal.me and make a little donation so thank you very kindly because if you're not familiar with the channel or the website with the outlet i don't do kickstarters that stick around so that is what that is. All right. Like I said, that is it for the news tonight. We're going to jump on into uh, Uber's Reich Adventures Volume 2 in just a moment. But something I, I did want to mention, and I'm kind of curious, and what I would like to know, uh, even from folks who are in chat, if you could comment on the video if you have an answer for this. Normally, I would say, yeah, yeah, just, you know, let me know in chat. But I do know a lot of people, they don't actually see the chat replay because the chat replay only shows up on certain devices. But comments are, are found everywhere. So if you were watching last week, as Fleming Huron swings on in, our other chat moderator. So we've got two people wielding the ban hammer. You were watching last week, I talked about Critical Role. And once again, I've got nothing against cr Critical Role. I don't know why people think I hate it. I don't. I just don't watch it. But I don't watch any of those kind of actual play programs of any sort. But I had mentioned that I thought the... I guess it's the, like... The common thought is Critical Role has brought in tons of new players to Dungeons and & Dragons, and I don't believe that's true. And someone actually had asked on a video in a comment over the weekend, well, so if you thought it, it hasn't been as, you know, as, as big a what should we say, enticement into the hobby? What did I think was behind the popularity of 5th edition D&D? &D? Or is 5th edition D&D &D not as popular as people try to make it out to be? <laughs> the madman says, it's a big band hammer. Requires two people to wield it. So Flaming Heron says, I don't, Jeff doesn't even watch his own actual plays. I've only done two. And yes, I did watch those just to see how crappy the video was. I mean, the video like this, me, it was great. Everybody else's shitty cams, awful. Even when you make them like small, it was like, yeah, 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 yeah. But we had fun. It was a Call of Cthulhu adventure. It was the haunted house or the haunting or whatever, whatever they call it now. Uh, yeah. It was kind of funny. So it was uh, Cameron, my nephew, his girlfriend at the time, Lexi, and uh, my best friend, Elliot Miller. That was kind of funny. Omanal's joined us in chat. Omanal says they think 4E was so different from the previous versions that it brought people back to the game, much like New Coke. Not talking 4E, uh, because let's be honest, 4E was a flop. It was. Why do you think... Hasbro and Wizards of the Coast turned around with a new edition so quickly after 4th edition came out. 
Anyway, so the question was, what do I think is behind the current popularity of 5th edition D&D, or is it a bunch of BS that Dungeons & Dragons is as popular as it is? So first off, Dungeons & Dragons is as popular as it is. Nobody's BSing anybody here. It sells very well. You can, you can take a look if you want to dig into sales numbers and that, like from Diamond Distributor Alliance. You'll see that, that they sell very well. They outsells Pathfinder. They're back to outselling Pathfinder on a pretty regular basis, which was not, actually, that was not the case with 4th edition. Pathfinder was kicking D&D's ass with 4th edition. So I don't think anybody's, you know, lying to you about D&D being that popular. Why I think Dungeons and Dragons has become as popular as it is now is because of people who played it as teenagers picking it back up to share with their family and friends. Because I have heard from a good number of people who have told me that's how they've gotten into 5th edition D&D. They played when they were younger. Now, it could be people my age who would have been playing Advanced Dungeons and Dragons or Basic, Expert, Legendary, whatever those, the rest were. I'm talking about the original BX. It could be the people like that. It could be people who came along for second edition D&D or third edition or 3.5 D&D. And, you know, they became adults and, you know, you just, vast majority of people, they don't have that free time to be playing role-playing games. Plus, there was the stigma on role-playing games, which was silly. Should have never been there because we had the satanic panic, which wasn't as big a deal as people today think it was. If, if you were there for it, like my pal Scott, who's in chat, we were around, we were playing role-playing games during the height of the satanic panic. It wasn't really that big a deal. But what I, I think we're seeing is that we've got adults, who had played D&D in the past in their youth, really enjoyed it. And they, they hear everywhere, oh, Dungeons and Dragons, Dungeons and Dragons. And nobody's sitting there going, ah, poo-poo! Dungeons and Dragons, what's wrong with you? Are you weird or something? That stigma is not there anymore. So I think that we have a lot of people returning to D&D and bringing friends and family, co-workers into the fold. I really do think that's what's going on right now. It is, it's not critical role because from what I understand, and once again, please comment in the comment section and let me know if you play 5e or if you've picked up 5e, or you run 5e, how did you get into it? Did you play D&D back in the day and come back? Do you watch Critical Role? And Critical Role brought you back into the fold. The reason why I say I don't think Critical Role really does it is because the people I've talked to who tend to watch Critical Role religiously, they don't play D&D. They'll sit there and they'll, they'll do fan art and stuff like that for Critical Role. They'll create characters, you know, not rolling them up, but they'll create their own characters. And that. They don't play, and they don't run it. And I think, on occasion, we do have people who come along, and they see Critical Role and go, oh, yeah, you know, I could do that. Hey, I easily do that. And they go out, and they pick up the three core books and go no further because they're like, oh, my God, what, oh, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Or they go and pick up the starter set or the essentials kit which I think are both excellent. I think they're fantastic introductions to 5th edition. But then they don't go any further because they, they realize it's not 
like the show. It's not going to be like the show. And there's going to be a shitload of work involved to create adventures. In fact, I could have swore maybe it was wired.com just had an article by some whiner, basically, talking about how they watched Critical Role and they went and bought all this stuff and they were like, oh, I'm going to create all these fantastic campaigns. And uh, it turned out it was like, oh, this is just beyond me. Yeah, because, you know, you, you can't walk into it thinking, oh, yeah, oh. Gary Gygax, uh, Ed Greenwood, uh, uh. Dave Arneson, they got nothing on me, baby. I've never played this game, and I'm going to create the most ultimate fantasy world ever. It ain't happening, Dooley. All right, let's see what uh, some folks are saying here in chat. Omanal says they remember getting weird looks and having to deal with horrified mothers in the 80s. Yeah, we didn't deal with that. We didn't. Then again, you know, we were in Chicago, so a little probably different setting than where a lot of people grew up. So uh, Flaming Heron says they heard someone say D&D is the most profitable division of Hasbro. Well, whoever you heard that from is absolutely wrong. Absolutely, completely wrong. I've talked about this before. It's like Hasbro is billions upon billions of dollars in uh, in net profit every year, and just in sales. We're not talking profit. We're talking sales. I think last I heard. And, and don't get me wrong, this is nothing to sneeze at. I think Wizards of the Coast brought in, in sales, not profit, in sales. So I think it was like $750 million, $800 million, right around there. So once again, absolutely nothing to sneeze at. But no, if any, the people who, who sit there and talk about how Wizards of the Coast is so profitable for Asbro, are the same people who, who think that all the Avalon Hill IPs that Hasbro owns is just a gold mine that they're sitting on, which we know it's not. I'd like to see them do stuff with it, but we know it's not a gold mine by any stretch of the imagination. All right, so Perkins says there are likely many factors. Remember Lord of the Rings, other fantasy movies, TV series. Yes, I get that. But got to remember, people who love Lord of the Rings aren't necessarily going to D&D. &D. They could have been going to the One Ring. They could now go to the second edition of the One Ring. So there is appeal to all. Regardless of what like show you like, there's, there's a pretty good likelihood that there is a role-playing game that is either designed specifically for that IP or that can easily be, you know, kit bashed for that IP. Flaming Heron says, well, 5e has so many systems that use that it uses. So stands the reason you've used 5e for one of your games. So the Madman says, how many people watching Critical Role haven't ever played before or were all, weren't already familiar with D&D? &D? I don't think too many wouldn't be familiar with D and D. Andy Sykes has joined us in chat. Uh, says they played AD and D. They run five E for a mixed age group from the late teens up. Never stopped playing RPGs, but it was often difficult to get players. It's easy to find players now. <laughs> Can't stand critical role. <laughs> but Mr. Eddie T says never watch critical role. I and once again, this this is not something we're picking on critical role. I'm just saying, so you got to realize, the Wizards of the Coast has made a tremendous investment into Matt Mercer and Critical Role in more ways than just money. And Matt Mercer is pretty well tied into Critical Role and Dungeons and Dragons. So it makes sense that they're both going to say, oh, hey. What a fantastic, you know, influence you have on people with our product. 
Scott says, I dislike 5e when Dungeon Masters play only by the rules. That's not role-playing. Well, it's role-playing, R-O-L-L playing. So, uh, yeah, so, you know, people are saying, most of the people I'm seeing in chat are saying, eh, don't really, don't really watch Critical Role. And once again, I'm not saying don't watch Critical Role. I'm just saying, I don't think it is a very big reason behind the popularity of fifth edition Dungeons and Dragons. It's not. At least in my opinion, it's not. Like I said, by all means, feel free, share your thoughts in the comments. Did you get into playing 5e because of Critical Role? Or did you get into 5e for a different reason? Or do you watch Critical Role and don't play Dungeons and Dragons? Don't know. Let me know. I'd appreciate it. All right. We're going to jump on into Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Uber's Reich Adventures Volume 2. Right after this quick intermission. It's intermission time, folks. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Step right over to our refreshment center for the most extravagant array of refreshment goodies ever assembled under one roof. Enjoy breathtaking, mouth-watering goodies. Everything from a snack to a delicious full meal. At our refreshment center, you'll find a large variety of goodies to satisfy your hunger, your thirst, or your sweet tooth. So hurry, hurry, hurry. Visit our refreshment center now. Yes, <laughs> that is the hot dog and bun I talked about a few weeks ago when we started talking about drive-in intermissions and that when the hot dog finally jumps into the bun, everybody at the drive-in is supposed to hit their horns because there's an innuendo there with the hot dog and the bun. So. You know, at some point you were going to see it. And here's the funny thing, just to, just, just to show you how memory works, right? So I used to sit there and I swore up and down that there was a ringmaster with a whip, cracking a whip at the hot dog for it to jump into the bun. That's not the case. But for years, I would I thought, yeah, yeah, that's what I remember. I remember there was a, Ringmaster, he's cracking a whip, and you know, the hot dog's jumping around, and the bun's just sitting there, like, Yeah, come on, come on. Guess not. So, 245 Dry Hacks, it says, I don't know how I feel about the hot dog. <laughs> Perkins Dearborn has pointed out games, board games, role playing games, all have gained popularity, and they believe that the total amount spent on games has grown. Oh, yeah. That, see, that's another discussion for another time. Uh, if people are being priced out of the hobby, I don't believe that to be the case. I think, I think once again, it's this, that's another case of people who are like, well, I want something. And they feel like they just because they want it, they deserve it. And trust me, I personally know people who are like that. And it's like, uh, don't know what to tell you. You know, if you can't afford something, I'd love to drive a Lamborghini. But I don't sit there and feel like it's my right. Damn Lamborghini, 
pricing me out of buying one of their sports cars. Anyway. So there's some more discussion about Wizards of the Coast as well. <laughs> Coco B says D&D is the Kleenex of role-playing games. <laughs> hey, I had nothing against Wizards of the Coast. But once again, you know me. I call it like I see it. So there have been some real dogs that they've released recently. And uh, Mr. Eddie T says they gravitate towards OSR price. See, that's something else. Role-playing games on a whole are far, far cheaper, or I guess we'll say more inexpensive to get into because the reality is all you need to do is have a core rule book and you can play forever with that. I'm sure a lot of you out there know Ken Height. Does a lot of Lovecraft stuff, uh, especially tons of stuff for Pelgrane Press. And I had an opportunity to sit, have pizza with him and John Zinzer from AEG. Elliot was with as well. And uh, Ken Height said, you know, anybody who thinks they're going to get into role-playing games, get rich is nuts. Because all you got to do is release one core book and somebody doesn't have to buy anything ever again. That's not usually the case. Flaming Heron says entitlement. Same thing happens in the computer game space. Whenever a new game comes out, somebody's going to complain they can't afford it. Yeah, I know. Scott Weagle says they saw Star Wars New Hope originally at a drive-in. I saw it in a theater. I saw it uh, in Norwich, the Norwich drive-in on Harlem Avenue in uh, Norwich, <laughs> Illinois, which was across the street from Chicago. So crossed Harlem Avenue, there you were. You were in the suburbs. Crossed back over, you were back in Chicago. All right. So, without further ado, tonight I'm going to take a first look at Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay Uber's Lake Adventures Volume 2 from Cubicle 7 Entertainment. Supplements written by my pal T.S. Lucart. Hey, if T.S. actually watches this episode, good to, good to see you, man. Thanks for watching. Can't wait to see you at uh, Gen Con. Dara McDonichka and Pedreg Murphy with artwork provided by Tom Ventre, Sam Manley, uh, Yosef Kuchura, and Daniel Kovacs. And I guarantee I have mispronounced a bunch of people's names. Sorry about that. The 128-page hardcover is available for $39.99. You can grab the PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG for $19.99. So Perkins says... Uh, Index card role-playing game was repackaged and released in French. New form factor, even a GM screen. Well, we do have that coming from Modifius Entertainment. In English, they're going to release the, the master set. I'd like to check that out. I have heard good things about uh, ICRPG. But we are not talking about that tonight. We are talking about Wifrup. So let's swing on over to the other camera, because here we've got Uber's like Adventures 2. More grim and perilous adventures in the Duchy of Uber's like. Take a look at the back here. Hey, that's exactly what it said on the front, too. Uber's like is a city in turmoil, riven with divided loyalties. From those who support the rule of Elkdorf, know the current situation cannot last. As rumors of empire shaking events filter in from Middenheim, Altdorf, and beyond. The case for a consolidation of power in Ubersreich grows stronger. In the midst of vying merchants, entitled nobles, callous spies, and outright thugs, a small group of adventurers and mercenaries have made a name for themselves. They have been arrested, enlisted, applauded as saviors, reviled as traitors, and dismissed as fools. But if they can also be ruthless, they may just be able to tip the machinations that will determine the fate of Ubersreich. Uber's Reich Adventures 2 contains, oh, five, I thought it was six, five new adventures, along with information expanding on events in the city of Uber's Reich, the setting established in the Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay starter set, 
reflecting the developments your characters may have experienced or caused during the events of the Enemy Within campaign. Also included is a guide to the Duke of Black Rock, the home to the once mighty Jungfreds, whom the Emperor so callously stripped of their noble right to rule Ubersreich. Learn more about the family, their allies, enemies, schemes, and plots ripe for players to explore. Jesus Nava has joined us, wishing us greetings from Mexico City. Well, welcome aboard. Thanks for swinging in to hang out. This Vod92 is with us as well in chat. We got a nice chat going on this Monday evenings. So, evenings, evening, singular, Jeff. It's only one evening tonight. Yeah, I better grab a sip here. All right, so we get a map of the glorious Reichland. To start off with. So, a few things do want to mention before we really dive in here. And, uh, of course, to find folks over at Cubicle 7 Entertainment were kind enough to provide me with this review copy. But, of course, obviously enough, neither I nor anyone else affiliated with the gaming gang has received any other sort of compensation for me to share this coverage with you. And of course, these days, it's actually, it's very important for you to know that. Also, I will be staying picture in picture up here. So I'll be cutting off a little portion of the upper left corner of the book. Also, we're not going to look at each and every page. I just want to give you a good feel for what's going on in this adventure supplement and uh, kind of give you a, a good idea of what's in the book. Also, these are adventures. There might be some spoilers. I have not cracked this book open, so it's not like I know what's going on, but it is very possible that we might end up on a page that gives us a reveal of a monster or, or who's behind what. So you have been warned. All right, let's jump on in. So we have the Deadly Dispatch. It says, one of the characters is approached by a courier bearing a far-traveled package, apparently addressed to them. The parcel contains a cunning puzzle box that holds occult items of a most necromatic nature and wasn't addressed to the character at all. Ah, well, it's like the mistaken identity in uh, The Enemy Within, which I think is a riot. I think it's very, very cool. Uh, Perkins says they love the artwork. Yeah, I like uh, the artwork as well. There's, there is one artist that we sometimes see in Wish releases, so I'm not super keen on. I'm not going to pick on them because I don't know if, they're, if they've done artwork in this. I don't think they have. All right, just kind of giving you an idea here. Then we got uh, Fish Rook Returns. So, of course, we've got our stat blocks at the end of the adventure here. Uh, we also have our rewards. The characters are successful in the adventure. Let's see what we've got here. Uber's Rike Adventures Fish Hook, I'm sorry, yeah, Fish Rook Returns is an adventure that explores what it is to be a legend, and what that legend might do to a less than romantic truth. The adventure takes place in and around Uber's Lake, but could be moved to any sizable town where a daydreaming noble might long for a more exciting life. Right, so we got some handouts here. That's kind of cool. Got an got a odd uh, disguise there. Somebody else in the disguise. Oh, they're probably highwaymen. Looks like we've got a map here for uh, the encounter. Probably a battle at the end. And we've got Double Trouble. Lucius Karstad Stomp, a member of the wealthiest merchant family in Ubersreich and youngest son of Helen Karstad Strumpf, the family matriarch, invites the characters to the family manor. He claims that he wants to write an epic poem about their exploits. But in fact, he fears for his life and employs the characters as bodyguards. All right. 
I know we've we've run across that family before in uh, Wifrip. So they are uh, a well-known uh, noble family. One aspect of Warhammer Fantasy roleplay that I dig, I think it's pretty funny, and I, I, I guess this is, no doubt this is a, a European thing. Maybe it's more specifically a British thing, but uh, there is that uh, dark sense of humor that runs throughout. And, you know, the player characters... The player characters in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay are vastly different than 5th edition Dungeons and Dragons or Pathfinder by every stretch of the imagination. And they're always poking fun at nobility. Uh, the nobles, the rich, they're always scumbags. <laughs> so... Uh, I personally think Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay has some of the uh, some of the most you know, outstanding personality in role playing games that are out there. I think the setting really does stand out, and of course, you know you got to give credit to Games Workshop, but I think Cubicle Seven has done really wonderful things with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. I, I honestly do. So, and it is not. It's it's a very different system mechanically than a, like a D20 system, but it's not an overly difficult game to learn. Uh, it, it Another aspect I like too is it does have a bit of almost uh, an OSR kind of vibe where you can die pretty quickly and easily, especially there's critical hits and you're not... Uh, your characters are not superheroes just starting out. In fact, even if they're experienced characters, they're still not superheroes. All right, so this is the wolf and the hobgoblin. So, oh, oh that's kind of a cool handout there. Now, did I accidentally skip an adventure title? Yep, the blessings that drew blood. Can I miss you, chance? 2509 IC. Lena Stein, a mediocre Sidron player who has just completed an uninspired set, was drowning her sorrows in an Aaron Grodd tavern, The Crossroads, in an alcoholic feud. <laughs> she struck a deal with an eerie, androgynous stranger who gave her a gift of a beautiful new Saturn. Lena remembers little of their conversation but recalls an odd bargain. The deal was that whilst the Saturn would play true for her until the next <laughs> some holiday, it would need to be anointed with the blood of six devout followers of the gods if it was to perform the following year. Well, well, well. Omanal says, yeah, just like our politicians. Yes, scumbags, fools. So another aspect I always talk about with Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is that the adventures don't just bog down into big, you know, set piece battles. In fact, combat is not as prevalent in Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay like you would possibly think it was. It's more a game of investigation, personality, um, Un, you know, unraveling different layers to conspiracies as opposed to, oh, well, okay, roll your, yeah, roll your persuasion roll and see if you can convince them to let you through the gate. Andy Sykes says they like uh, Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Their players, not so much. Because it's so different. Because it's so different. You know who tends to enjoy Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay? are gamers who play Call of Cthulhu. Because it's a, li it's a little similar. It's not a D100 system like basic role-playing or, or Call of Cthulhu would be, but it is it, it really does have some similar aspects to it. In fact, 
originally first edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay was kind of a Lovecraftian fantasy role-playing game. The forces of chaos are, are kind of actually, well, originally sort of fueled by the Cthulhu mythos, although you didn't have, like, the mythos entities. So now we get into a Guide to Black Rock, which is another duchy. A bit of a timeline for them there. Some NPCs, it looks like. Yep. Uber's right and the enemy within. This is what I was kind of curious about is I almost had the impression that these adventures take place after the enemy within, which we are still waiting on two more hardcover releases. So chapters four and five are out in PDF. They've been out for quite some time. We're still waiting for those releases in hardcover plus their companions. And I, I understand that Cubicle 7 Entertainment changed printers. And just off the top of my head, I think, I think they're, they're, print, they're printers in Germany. And uh, there were, uh, of course, with everything, the past year, we've had, you know, all those uh, supply chain issues and everything else. So I think they fi finally ironed some stuff out. So, cause I've been, I've been holding off. I've been, I've been waiting for the, the physical releases for the last two chapters of the enemy within to, to share anything about it. And he says that, yeah, call Cthulhu is actually their favorite system. Omanal says it's definitely a slow year, yeah, slow year. Yeah, that's a word, slower. Definitely a slower and deadlier game with a pretty gritty feel. And it does have a, a, a bit of sense of humor to it. That's, that's what I also kind of like about it. Uh, and, you know, like I said before, the characters aren't, characters aren't superheroes. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is not a role-playing game where the player characters are, you know, beginning characters, and all of a sudden, they're like, oh, hey. It's like, you're our saviors, first-level characters. We're going to allow you to make all the decisions for the rest of this whole adventure campaign because you're first-level characters. No. Normally, you know, <laughs> Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay adventure uh the if the like the powers that be don't believe the characters when they're like oh hey this is going on there's scaven in the sewers yeah yeah right get out of here you losers so yeah i just like i said i i really do like uh the fourth edition of warhammer fantasy roleplay i know there are people out there like oh it's too woke now like i I don't know what to tell you. I mean, if you think Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is woke, I, I can't even imagine what you think of Pathfinder in 5th edition D&D. &D. All right, Scott says, Jeff nailed it there. I'm not sure what I nailed. <laughs> Maybe the people who like Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay are the types who also like Call of Cthulhu. All right, so anyway, there you have once again. Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay, Uber's Reich Adventures, Volume 2. From my friends over at Cubicle 7 Entertainment. This hardcover is available for $39.99. You can score the PDF over at Drive-Thru RPG for $19.99. Yes. 40 bucks is pricey for 128 pages. I can't let Cubicle 7 off the hook on that. I got to mention that. A saving grace is it is adventures. So you tend to get a bit more bang for your buck when it's an adventure book as opposed to just like a gazetteer or something like that. Uh, 245 Traxon's asking if Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay is still on its first edition. No, it's on its fourth. Fourth edition is what uh, Cubicle 7 does. 
first and second was Games Workshop, and I remember I actually picked up first edition Warhammer Fantasy Roleplay. Never ran it. <laughs> picked up, used to pick up White Dwarf even before they had like Space Marine stuff in it, Warhammer 40K. Uh, and then, of course, after it, because I played a little bit of Warhammer 40K, more so uh, Warhammer 40K Epic or Adeptus Titanicus, I think it was called, when it, when it first came out. And then third edition was with Fantasy Flight Games. So that's who had the third edition. Yes, Omanal's chiming in as well. So yeah, so there you have it. Uh, fourth edition draws a lot from second edition and a bit from first. But there were some things about first edition that were a little wonky. Uh, weapon damage was especially one of them. And that uh, is not the case with fourth edition. I, in fact, a lot of people prior to fourth edition coming out, second edition was their favorite. So there is that. All right. That is it for this time out. Bit longer show than normal. Not too crazy. So before I wrap up, I do want to mention that we did crack the 6,500 subscriber count over at the YouTube channel. So much obliged. Thank you very much. Here's something that I don't understand. It's got nothing to do with YouTube, but it has to do with Twitter. So on Twitter, the gaming gang has, well, it's me at the gaming gang, has what, something like 7,132 followers. And we hang at that all the time. I've been around that follower number for at least nine months. And when I say around that follower number, I'm talking it stays in the 7130s. It's very weird. And then I'll get, you know, oh, so-and-so's following you. So-and-so's following you. Just a little trickle here and there. But it's always around the same thing. Whereas each month, we have hundreds of new subscribers to the YouTube channel. In a month, the Twitter account, which also gets all the news pieces and stuff posted to it, gets like zero. <laughs> like a net zero. Two people stopped following, two people started following. It's weird. I, I have no idea. Uh, Omanal says when third edition came out, Zweihander filled the niche. I'm, I'm not super keen on Daniel Fox. So for one, I personally think Zweihander is just effectively a ripoff of Warhammer fantasy roleplay without any credit given. Now, I've never looked at it. But that's kind of the vibe I've gotten, and that's kind of what I've heard from other people as well. So, down now. And I hear he's the weird dude. So, I'll leave it at that. All right. Anyway, if you like this video, by all means, please give it a quick thumbs up. Subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel if you haven't already. And if you do subscribe, ding that bell. Knock the mic around. Bang it around. See, thankfully, I have a little shock mount here. Otherwise, you'd hear like thump, thump. Woman else says, yeah, Zoy Hitter is absolutely a ripoff. Anyway, so when you're not watching videos on the Gaming Gang channel, be sure to visit thegaminggang.com for all the latest in gaming news, reviews, and a whole lot more. You know the drill. Get your geek on at thegaminggang.com. Um, I will be back tomorrow. We're going to take a look at Tiny Epic Dinosaurs from Gamelin Games. So we are going to unbox and take a first look at Tiny Epic Dinosaurs. So tune in for that. Of course, if you were watching live tonight, thank you kindly. Much appreciated. If you took part in chat, 
Those are bonus points. Those are bonus experience points. You're going to level up soon. I promise. I use experience points. I don't use like plot points to level all of you up. So you'll just have to keep tracking those experience points. Of course, I know a lot of people out there, they don't have an opportunity to watch live. Maybe they watch on Memorex. Regardless, however you watch any of the videos on this channel, just know I just really appreciate it. I really, really do. It, it really does mean a lot. Because uh, I know there are a lot of outlets you could be hanging out, checking out tabletop gaming news and reviews and, and stuff like that. All right, everybody enjoy the rest of your evening, morning, afternoon, whatever time of day it is where you're at. And of course, here's hoping you always get to enjoy plenty of great gaming with your gang. See you tomorrow. Oh, hey, you're still here. Well, if that's the case, by all means, subscribe to the Gaming Gang channel by clicking right here. Check out the latest episode of the Gaming Gang Dispatch or find out what YouTube recommends you check out from the channel. And of course, once again, I'm Jeff McAleer. Thanks for watching.